when you start modeling that what follows a feeling is oftentimes some sort of action or some sort of move that you're going to make, when you model that for your child, you're showing them that there is a way out of this feeling, not to dismiss it. We can be in those feelings, but that action helps. So very simply, for example, you're eight years old and your favorite toy just broke or your younger brother just smashed the creation that you made, right? You built this huge Lego tower, this huge block tower, and your three-year-old came in and smashed it and they're furious. Of course you feel angry about that. Of course you do. Is there anything I can do to help? Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Hi, Robin. Hi, Lynn. Happy New Year again. Happy New Year again. Yeah, we're in the middle of 2023's new resolutions, <laughs> uh, new goals, <laughs> you know, new aspirations. I'm going to tell you the dream I had when I woke up okay. on the first day of 2023. So it was one of those dreams you have, you know, sort of as you're waking up, it's usually pretty vivid. So my dream was that I was involved in some sort of event I don't really know what was going on, but there were a lot of kids and teenagers, and it was in this big rambling farmhouse. And my job at the event was that there were about 80 to 100 cats and kittens, and my job was to keep track of them. (laughs) (laughs) So there we go. That's how I'm heading into 2023. Yeah. So. I, I don't really do dream analysis, but damn, that one is just right there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's funny. Well, you know, before we start talking about today's episode, I wanted to share something that I saw during the holiday. You know, my son and I went on a cruise mm-hmm. together because I am a travel writer and travel advisor. Right. And we saw something that it really intrigued me. I mean, I felt very badly, but there was a really fun water slide on the ship we were on where like you could go in a double inner tube down. It wasn't that fast or scary. And it was funny because as we were in the line uh, and we were getting to the top. So here he was and he was like, are you having any nervous feelings about (laughs) this ride? And I was like, not really, but it's normal that we both feel this way because we've never done it before, but I have a feeling it'll be really fun. And he's like, yeah, me too. So we get on the ride and it was totally fine. It was great. We had a fun time. We got off the ride the second time. Yeah. And a girl I'd say who was probably 12, there's a chance she was 13, but I'd say she was like a classic 12 year old. And I looked at her because nobody was around and she was screaming, crying (gasps) and not, you know how like when kids are little, there's the cry for attention, cry for hunger, Mm -hmm. cry because you're tired and then cry when you're truly physically hurt. Mm hmm. She was crying like she was truly physically hurt. So Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? What's wrong? So I see her, there's nobody else around her and two of the ship's staff who run the different slides alert. And one of them was like, hey, and calls to the other staff member, is she okay? Did she hurt herself? And she's like sobbing as she's walking away from the slide. And the other staff member says, she's just really sad because she really wants to go down the slide, but she's afraid. Mm. And I have to say that when I saw this child in such distress, Mm -hmm. I had never seen it such where I saw there was a battle going on herself and she's genuinely struggling with it. It was so potent. Yeah. Well, and I think it's not surprising at all that you say if you're estimating this girl's age that it's around 12 or 13, because that's when kids start to become more developmentally aware of the bigger picture of this. So she is realizing that she's missing out. So when little kids are struggling with fears or whatever, they you don't see that. You see a little bit of that battle sometimes in young kids. You know, they want to go to the birthday party or this, but they don't really engage in that conflict within themselves. And then when they hit like 10, 11, 12, when, and then especially when they're in middle school, 
oh my gosh, we just see that battle so powerfully. It gets so much more sophisticated. Yeah. They're able to think about it. And also because they so want to be a part of things. So that that social mandate, that developmental mandate of, I want to participate. I want to be included in things. I don't want to miss out on things. I don't want to be rejected. That shows up so powerfully at that age. And then the anxiety is there to say, nope, 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 not going to do it, not going to do it. So it is really painful to watch if we don't do anything about that. And we watch how it moves through the middle school years and then up into the high school years, that battle only intensifies. And then oftentimes, you know, we see kids getting more and more depressed because they realize their anxiety is taking over and getting in the way. So, yeah, you saw absolutely that moment of internal conflict that is so painful for tweens and teens when their anxiety shows up. Yeah. Well, I didn't see the parents. And you know me, of course, I would have been like, hi, I have this podcast. I think yeah. that you should hear my sister-in-law. Yeah. It yeah. might be helpful. So I never I never got to do that. But in light of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk today about, you know, we've talked in the past about parenting phases we just hate that we wish people stopped using. It's time to talk about the parenting phrases that should always be ready in your back pocket. Right. Have them right there. And how that could have played out if the parent was talking to this girl just about going down the water slide? And what are the phrases that eventually start building the mantras and the internal dialogues in your kids too, right? Yeah. We want to have these things just like we have these stock phrases that we use. I mean, for those of you who are listening, if you think about the stock phrases- Which would be everybody. Oh yeah. Right. For those of you who are listening right now, as opposed to not listening. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Good point. So all of you, hello, you probably have stock phrases that you remember that your parents used. Like I could think of a few stock phrases that my parents used. You could probably think of a few. We have them. We pull them out. Some of them for parents, you're going to remember were not so helpful. And some of them were said out of frustration or anger. And then there were other phrases that parents used that were just exactly what you needed at the time. It's good to make sure that you have those phrases, like you said, Robin, in your back pocket because the content doesn't matter. When your child is struggling and trying to work through uncertainty or going through a big change or managing stress, we want to have those phrases we use that propel them forward, that also let them know that you understand, you're there, you're supporting, but how are we going to move forward? That's what we want to pay attention to. Because remember, anxiety says, no, thank you, I'm out. Okay, so we're going to talk about the five foundational phrases that you use and you'll show us how to use. So tell us the first one. Okay, the first one, nobody's going to be surprised about because I say this all the time. I couldn't do my job without the two words, of course. So this is the validating phrase. Of course you feel that way. I get it. Of course you're nervous. Of course you're angry. Of course you're disappointed. Of course you're sad. We want to say to kids, it's okay that you feel the way you feel because human beings are very emotional beings. So the first one is, of course, I get it. You feel that way. So you're normalizing, you're helping them remove shame from the emotion. You're allowing the emotion to be there. Right. And one of the things we know with anxiety is that Kids and grownups too start to get very worried about the fact that they're feeling this way. And so what happens over time is people say, oh, I get so anxious in this situation. Oh my gosh, what if I feel anxious? Oh my gosh, I'm so worried that I'm going to feel anxious. So we really want to normalize it and make a lot of room that of course you feel that way. Of course you feel disappointed. Of course you feel this. You know, I talked about that therapist that was diagnosing kids with disappointment syndrome, right? Which is not a thing. Of course, of course, of course. It makes room for the feelings. And then you get to talk about what are we going to do next, right? Of course you feel that way. Validate, validate, validate. Okay. And then after validation. After validation, you want to say, you remember, I love those how questions. How can I help? Or another variation of that, is there anything that I can do to help you manage these feelings right now? Or just, is there anything I can do? How can I help? Is there anything I can do? When you start modeling that what follows a feeling 
is oftentimes some sort of action or some sort of move that you're going to make, when you model that for your child, you're showing them that there is a way out of this feeling, not to dismiss it. We can be in those feelings, but that action helps. So very simply, for example, you're eight years old and your favorite toy just broke or your younger brother just smashed the creation that you made, right? You built this huge Lego tower, this huge block tower, and your three-year-old came in and smashed it and they're furious. Of course you feel angry about that. Of course you do. Is there anything I can do to help? How can I help? And they may say, you know, there's nothing you can do. I'm just mad. And you say, oh, I get it. I get it. You should be mad right now. That is a totally appropriate way to feel right now. Yep. Of course, we've talked about this before. You then don't give permission for for your angry eight-year-old to do whatever they want to do to the toddler. You're teaching them how to manage those feelings. Of course, you feel that way. How can I help? Do we want to rebuild the tower? Do you need to take a break? Do you need some time alone? Do you want me to take him into another room? How can I help? And you're getting them to start thinking about problem solving. Right. So that I know I'm trying to think about how to solve these feelings of anger. I'm trying to figure out how to solve a response to these feelings of sadness. So always having that how, what can I do is allowing them to feel validated but know that there's not a permanence to this. Correct. There is an action they can take to move to something else. Right. Let's take a break and we'll get back to number three. You know, getting the help you need doesn't have to be a challenge. Talkspace is so convenient and accessible. You can get mental health care with or without insurance to fit your needs. Because when you work on yourself, you're going to see and feel positive changes in all areas of your life. Take it from me. I talk all the time about strengthening your relationships and giving you a more optimistic outlook on life. Our listeners are so committed to working on themselves, strengthen their relationships with their family members. Who could really do this without therapy too? Here's where Talkspace can come in. And it's the number one online therapy platform with thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. And your therapist can help you set and achieve your goals. The thing about Talkspace is that it's mental health care that meets you wherever you are. It eliminates the need to commute to appointments, miss time at work, line up childcare. Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send text messages to your therapist, let them know the issues you're facing in real time. And Talkspace is secure and private using the latest end-to-end bank grade encryption technology. So it stores client information complying with the latest HIPAA regulations. Don't let the cost get in the way either. Talkspace is in network with most major insurers. That means that insured members on average pay a $20 copay or less. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com and use code FLUSTER. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and use the code FLUSTER to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. Uh, Robin, I don't love grocery shopping. I know you don't. I'll tell you. Thrive Market This is a way to get all of my grocery and household essentials without having to go to the grocery store. It is so convenient. It gets shipped right to my doorstep. For example, my seventh generation cleaning products right there. Well, as a Thrive Market member, you can save money on every single order on average, and I save 30% each time. Wow, that's amazing. On top of the massive savings on each order, Thrive Market has a deals page that changes daily. You can get cash back on so many brands and they have a price match guarantee. I love the deals page. I love the filters on their website and they have an app where you can go and look for certified gluten-free snacks, non-toxic cleaning essentials. You can curate your own shopping experience with a click of a button. When you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join they give. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order, plus a free $60 gift. 
So go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, so now back to the show. All right, so critical, so important. This is a phrase that you should really pay attention to for your younger kids, for sure, but absolutely pay attention to with your tweens and your adolescents. Giving them the language to recognize, to understand that the way they feel right now is temporary. So the next phrase that you want to have in your back pocket is, I get it. This is temporary. You will not always feel this way. And very closely connected to that is, this is a part of you learning and growing. This is not who you are, and you will not always feel this way. So anything that you can offer, whatever phrase you use, but it has to convey this is temporary. You won't always feel this way. Given what I have learned from you that the belief that things will change is is like a primary foundation for an approach to managing depression. Do you feel like this is what you say, especially when we're dealing with sadness? Yeah. Or anger, right? Sadness or matter. anger. It doesn't matter, right? If you feel nervous, you know, it, it, talking to somebody that's starting something new, right? So you're starting high school, you're starting middle school, you're joining a new team, you're starting a job, you're stepping in that you feel nervous about it, you feel anxious about it, you feel sad about it, you feel whatever, that experience counts and doing things and moving forward is a way to deal with your emotions. It doesn't mean getting rid of them, dismissing them, denying them, suppressing them, but action counts. And the phrase that you were just referring to is the phrase positive expectancy is the belief that things can change. So this is temporary you know, it, it could be temporary for a long time. You know, I've talked about my son having a broken heart, right? His broken heart didn't get better over a week. It hasn't gotten better yet, actually, but it's not a permanent condition. And that's really, really important for our kids to hear right now, especially our adolescents. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It, it applies to sadness. It could apply to anger, disappointment, shame, embarrassment. Yep. It could apply to anything. Yep. Our feelings aren't permanent. Our feelings aren't permanent. Right. And we have to really be careful with the way we're talking about that with our kids because they are hearing it and they are believing it and it's not helpful. Okay, Lynn. So let's recap. We've talked about validation. Of course, this is temporary. Right. We've talked about this is temporary. Of course, you feel that way. We've talked about taking action. How can I help? so that you're moving kids forward. You're talking to them about solutions that are helpful because they are active. Okay. Let's go through the last two and then we'll apply these in very real life scenarios. Okay. So the next one is how you can have a phrase to manage your big emotions when you're dealing with your kids. So it is perfectly, well, it's, it's not even perfectly fine. It's actually really helpful for you to have in your back pocket to say, I'm feeling blank right now. And so I just need a moment or I just need to take some time. And then when you use that and you're imagining us use that, are you imagining us saying that and like leaving the room? Are you imagining us saying that and just sitting there quietly? Either one. If you have little kids and you say, I'm feeling really angry right now and I need to take a minute and then you leave the room, that can be a little distressing for them because you're leaving, right? So with older kids, you can say, I'm feeling really frustrated right now. I'm just going to go upstairs and take a minute and I'll be back. With little kids, you might say, I'm feeling frustrated right now. So let me just take a moment to think about what I'm going to say. And so maybe you're just sitting there and maybe you, you know, you, you take a few deep breaths, you go get a drink of water, you show them because you're modeling this for them too. You're showing them I'm having big emotions right now. So I'm just going to take a moment to move out of that place of reactivity is what you're trying to do and trying to show. We did an episode a while ago about yelling at your kids and people have a hard time believing when I tell them that I don't yell at my kids. 
you don't yell at your kids. And people think like, well, how do you do that? Because I take a break sometimes. Doesn't mean that I don't want to yell at them. Doesn't mean that I don't have thoughts and fantasies about what I would say to somebody if I were really angry at them. But showing them I'm feeling this way right now. So you're naming the feeling and I'm going to just take a break. That's a really helpful thing for you to do as a parent. You're modeling, but you're also giving yourself some time to respond in a way that's going to be better than what might come out in the moment. You can do it at work too. You can do it in your marriage. You can do it when you're uh, talking to the customer service person on the phone about the overdraft charge, right? It doesn't matter. Just learn how to take a pause. I want to go back to the the anger thing. When our kids are really little, you know, as you say this, what you're what you're ultimately saying is, I'm ultimately modeling how I wish my seven year old or eight year old responds when the three year old brother attacks his Lego set, right? And so I know it might sound far fetched, but in reality, if they could sit there with their anger and say, "I'm so angry right now," mm-hmm. and you say, "Of course you're angry," mm-hmm. and then if you had they, you'll say, "I just need a second because you say, how can I help? And they'll say, I just need a second to feel this way. When they were really little, I remember if I was very angry and I could tell I needed to take that break, I still use the power of physical touch and connection. Mm -hmm. Sit on my lap and I'm going to give you a squeeze, but I'm pretty angry right now. And I need a second to think about my words so that I didn't scare my child Right. And that I know how to still be connected to you through my anger. Right. That's why with little kids, you don't say, I'm angry at you and I have to leave you alone right now. Right. But with older kids, you can say, I'm really frustrated right now. I'm just going to go into the kitchen for a minute. Or I even said when my kids were older, I would say, I am really frustrated right now. And I'm, I need some time to think about how I'm going to handle this. So give me some time. And sometimes I would even say, I'm going to think about how I want to manage this and I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go, you know, do blankety blank and then we can talk about it. It really is okay for you to give yourself a period of time to get out of that heightened reactive state. That's why this is so helpful. That heightened reactive state is not helpful because you're not thinking rationally. You're coming from a place of emotion. We get it. I'm a parent. I get it. I'm a human being. But how do you step back and show your kids that it's okay to just take a moment? If I had listened to this episode as a mom, there's this one moment. I'm actually just like a few yardsticks away from where it happened. But there was a moment where my daughter pushed and pushed and pushed me to a a limit that she actually hasn't pushed me to since. And I remember feeling more rage in that moment than she'd ever conjured before. I didn't have these exact words and I, and I didn't do it a hundred percent right at all. I mean, you know, it's never a hundred percent right, but I know I did not do it as well. If I had known this, I know I would have been able to manage to say it in that moment because it was thought through. It was something that was planned and organized to pull out of my pocket. So I just, I hope this is going to help a couple of parents feel really prepared when they are really, really challenged. Well, and that said is if you don't pull it out and you do have a moment like you had, that's okay too. One of these episodes is not going to damage your kids, particularly if you can come back later and say, you know what, I just should have taken a break. I should have shut my mouth or I was feeling those big feelings. I mean, you can always come back and say, let's have a redo, right? You can always come back and say that. After we did an episode at some point since we started this podcast, I thought of this moment. So I went up to my daughter and I was like, I don't know if you remember, but you know, like five or six years ago, (laughs) you know, this happened. (laughs) Yeah. And I just, I really want to say, I'm sorry. And she's just like, what are you talking about? What are you talking? I don't even remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, She was fine. Yeah. But still, but did that made you feel better to, to acknowledge it? And you also modeled that for her too. You said, this happened a while ago. I've been thinking about it. I don't even know if it bothers you anymore, but I just want to acknowledge that I did this and I own it, right? That's a great thing to do as a parent. And that's, again, we're trying to model. See, the thing is we don't want to, I'm giving you these phrases, not so that you can make sure that you 
walk around on eggshells and your kid doesn't get upset or that you're helping them manage every single feeling they have so that you're a perfect parent, that can really go overboard. Sure. It's about creating a culture in the family about acknowledging and invalidating emotions and also using these tools to go backwards when we do mess up because we will. Right. We don't want to get to the point where if your five-year-old is refusing to put their shoes on and you say, I can see that you're really frustrated right now. I get it. And then you could follow it up with, but put your shoes on, <laughs> right? I mean, you don't have to be like, I understand why, you know, I always say talk 85% less. And there's a lot of parenting stuff right now that's really promoting talk 85% more, right? These are short phrases that you use, still follow the motto of talk 85% less, put it out there, right? I get it. I see that you don't want to put your shoes on. I see how frustrated you are. Now put your shoes on, please. We've got to go, right? So you're acknowledging, you're acknowledging, you're validating, but then you're not trying to figure out how to orchestrate the family's world so that your child doesn't have these feelings. So I just want to be clear about that. All right. I got a few more. You want to hear, you want to hear a few more? Yeah. Okay. So one thing too is I want parents to notice when their kids do things well and when they're developing skills. So you can have in your back pocket a phrase that says something like, I'm impressed how you did that. Or how did you do that? Something that gets them to think about the steps they took to arrive at this place of mastery, to arrive at this place of independence, right? So your child comes home and says, you know, look what I did at school. And you go, wow, how did you do that? Instead of just saying, oh, that's fantastic, or oh, that's beautiful, or oh, you're the best artist ever, you say, how did you do that? Which is that steps and sequencing that is really such a valuable skill, which I talk about all the time, which is the opposite of that overwhelm of anxiety that shuts you down. Well, the other thing about success that I've learned when we did our course on managing kids' anxiety is that anxiety wants you to forget your past successes. So after there is a success, Get them to really remember how they feel so that you can help them recall that feeling in that moment where they're hesitant to try it again. That's right. I call that building reminder bridges so that they can pull that back up. And it's so helpful for kids to practice that type of thinking where they say, well, I started off as a beginner and then I got to this place where I figured it out a little bit more. And then I got to this place where I felt very masterful. And now I'm at the place where I don't even think about it anymore because I've learned the skill. That type of thinking and that type of progression is enormously helpful for so many things. And a lot of kids just do it naturally. But if you've got a kid that tends to be more cautious or more anxious, if you tend to be more cautious or anxious, you may need just to lay it out a little bit more explicitly. Okay, so let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll do a recap. And then I want to hear you use these in very real and common family moments. Okay. It's a brand new year and Every Plate is here to help you achieve all of your resolutions. Every Plate helps you save money with delicious, affordable recipes delivered to your door. Plus, if you're looking to cook more, Every Plate helps you expand your cooking skills with easy to follow recipes and you can whip them up in just six simple steps. It's going to be a great year with Every Plate. And I have to tell you, we have been subscribers in the fall and what it has done is really distributed the labor of meals in our household. The steps are so easy. Even my 11-year-old son can actually make dinner now. Grocery bills are going up. Every plate is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping. Start the year on the right bite with Every Plate's newest meal preference, Nutrish and Delish. And it features around 650 calories or less. Each wholesome, satisfying dishes help you stay on track with your goals without all the guesswork. Skip the takeout. You can keep your commitment to saving money and get Every Plate delivered instead. It's 58% cheaper than your average casual meal. I have to say that's why we've loved every plate. I know that I always have the groceries in the fridge ready to make dinner. And it's been so great to get out of my own recipe rut. Get started with every plate for just $1.39 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering the code FLUSTER139. Go to everyplate.com slash podcast and then enter the code FLUSTER139. One three nine, just a dollar thirty nine per meal. That's a one hundred and thirty four dollar value. Fantastic! Hey, everybody, this is Robin at Fluster Clocks. 
when Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's luxrecess.com. L-U-X-C-R-E-C-E-S-S dot com. Okay, Lynn, what were you saying? Here are the five phrases in no particular order, because I honestly can't remember what order we did them in. All right. So number one, of course you feel that way. Then you follow up with that. Is there anything I can do or how can I help? Right. So number two, how can I help? Number three is a direction for you parents that you're modeling. I'm feeling blank, so I need to take some time right now. Number four is that we want kids to recognize that their feelings are temporary. So you're not always going to feel this way. This is temporary, really important. And then the last one is, how did you do that? Or I'm so impressed that you got that done. Tell me how you did that. That's the steps and sequencing phrase that we want to use. So those are the five. I love the how did you do that? Because especially when our children are young and they do all these things. And it's like, oh, that's so good. Oh, that's so good. Good job. Oh, which is not a good thing to say. Here's a great replacement. Yeah. How did you do that? Look at what you just did. How did you do that? Right? So they climbed up the slide and went down the slide by themselves, or they made macaroni and cheese, or they tied their shoes, or they completed their project for school or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And let's just pause and think of what a better badass reply that is than good job. That's right. Good job. Yeah. Good job. What's taught by that? Like not great lessons actually. Yeah. And when we say to them, how did you do that? You're actually giving them an opportunity to think about what they did to make that happen. Right. They're learning the sequences of mastery. That's right. And that it took practice. And you can even say, you know, you're having a conversation and you can say, oh my gosh, I remember when you didn't know how to do that at all. One of the questions that I ask teachers or I tell teachers to ask their students at points through the year is think of something that at the beginning of the school year, you did not know how to do that now is pretty comfortable for you or pretty natural for you to do something that you've mastered. Let's think about how you did that. I want them to understand there's a beginning and a middle and an end because anxious kids, worried kids have difficulty stepping into things that feel uncertain. If you've got a kid who's perfectionistic, they have this idea that they can't start until they already know how to do it, which isn't realistic. Um, But that's what shuts them down. That's that all or nothing thinking. So we're breaking down that global all or nothing thinking. How did you do that? right? It also just lets you engage in your kid. You know, sometimes we say good job that, you know, they they come home and they pull out their piece of art or they pull out something and you look at it and you go, good job, right? But this this allows you to have a little bit. And again, you don't have to do it with every single thing they do, right? If they, if they, you know, brush their teeth or if they tie their shoes or if they show you a, a, a piece of math homework, you don't have to sit down and treat it like it's a, you know, a, a summit at Camp David, but you can just offhandedly say, you know, how did you do that? When it seems as if to you and to them, it's something that's worthy of noting because it's some sort of success. That's a great time to pull that out. So in the life of a family with kids of all ages, let's break down a few different scenarios for the different age groups. So you've got a six-year-old who just wiped out on their scooter in the driveway. Yep. So you say to them, oh my gosh, are you, you know, first of all, you might say, oh, did that hurt? Are you okay? You want to watch your reaction because kids absolutely mirror their reaction to injury and pain based on a parent's reaction. The research is really clear about that in pretty dramatic ways. So they wiped out on their scooter and you go, you know, of course you give them some love. Oh my gosh. Oh, let me look. Oh, how, how is it? And then you can ask that question. Is there anything you need me to do right now? 
or how can I help? Right? So you, you offer that empathy. How can I help? Also, this is a time that they fall off their scooter and they've banged up their knee or something. And it's a, you know, it's a scrape and they're feeling a little defeated. They may say, I'm never riding this scooter again. Right now, that's you, you want to launch into like, well, of course you're going to ride this scooter again, blah, blah, blah. You can say, oh, I get how you feel. I bet you're not going to feel this way in a few minutes. Or I wonder how long you're going to feel this way. Or, oh, I can relate to that. Right. Feelings are temporary. So it's a way to acknowledge what's going on for them. And when they say that big, permanent, overwhelming thing, I'm never doing this again. You go, oh, I get you feel that way right now. There's that global language. You know, this brings up actually also the the common reaction when your kids did have a, you know, an accident, Mm -hmm. right? There's like a bleeding scrape on their knee and those hurt so Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of parents. And for some reason, this is nails on a chalkboard to me. When parents say, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. It's like gaslighting 101. That doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right. It's like, no, um, it does hurt a lot. So validating it but not coddling it to a degree. So like, what's that balance? Yeah. That balance is saying, oh, I, I totally, oh, that looks like it hurts. And and that looks like it hurts. That looks like it hurts. Yep. And then be able to say, um, how can I help? Or is there anything you need me to do right now? Right. And they may say, I need you to kiss it if they're little, right. I used to call that mommy magic. Or maybe they say, I think I need a band aid. you know, whatever. So get them into the mindset that what do we do next when you hurt yourself? What do you do next? Yeah. So let's move up the age ladder a little bit and let's talk about a tween and somebody did something mean to them at school. Yeah. So they got rejected or humiliated or embarrassed or, right, or something, picked on or picked something. On, right. Something. So same things like you want to validate, oh, of course you feel that way. Right. I totally get it. I've said before, don't then launch into a story right away of what happened to you when you were a tween because in that moment, they don't want to hear about how you know, somebody made fun of your bangs not being high enough with hairspray. Not that that happened to you. <laughs> You mean my bangs not being high enough with hairspray? Well, that was just so specific. I know it was. Did that happen to you? No, no, because I don't think I even knew what hairspray was for what? a long time. You were an early 80s child. I was like a mid to late 80s child. You definitely had to hairspray some of those bangs, right? Yeah, no, I didn't hairspray my bangs. I don't even know if I had bangs. I think the reason I use that very specific example was because my husband has been watching MTV classic videos recently, and there's been a lot of hairspray. And we also watched the Stevie Nicks documentary of Fleetwood Mac, and there was a lot of bangs and a lot of hairspray also. Oh, I have to watch that. Yeah. My husband and daughter found my high school passport. And so they were looking at that photo and, you know, because of my age, everyone got a desperately seeking Susan Madonna bob, Oh, you know, around 1983. Yeah. Like, did you cut your hair short and try and do a Madonna bob too? No, I did have a sort of a Lady Diana, Princess Diana short haircut for a while. Ouch. Yeah. The whole Peggy Hamill, Diana shortcut. Yeah. I had the Bob. I was, I'm a little younger. We had the Bob, the Bob thing. Yeah. But my daughter's like, it's a lot of volume, mom. Yeah. I never had volume, but I bet if you looked at pictures, I mean, I think I have a very similar, like I have bangs and straight hair, pretty much like from the age of two to the age of uh, the current 57. There were a few short lived deviations from that, but yeah, it's been pretty, pretty solid. Yeah. Okay. We digress. Yeah. <laughs> you did have a bob when I met you, actually. Your I hair did? was quite short. Yeah, your hair was very short when I met you. Oh, all right. Well, so that was one of those short deviations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the, the teen has been, the tweener has been, you know, gotten rejected, hurt feelings. Somebody posted something on Snapchat or whatever, right? Okay. We'll bring it up into the current century. So you want to say, of course, of course they feel that way. Of course you feel that way. And then you want to say, you know, this is really hard. I get it. You're not always going to feel this way. This is where we bring in the temporary. This is a normal part of learning and growing. And boy, relationships are really tricky in middle school, right? So you give some validation, but it's not who they are and they're not going to feel this way forever. That's an important message to give. And then you can say, is there anything I can do to help? Right? You can ask that. Is there anything I can do to help? 
Yep. So validate. Of course you feel this way. Is there anything I can do to help? And this is not a permanent thing for you. And it's a normal part of being in seventh grade or in eighth grade. So in high school, it could be related to matters of the heart. Yep. It often is. I mean, in high school, it's disappointment. So you want so strongly, you want so clearly to have a sense of connection. You know, we talked about the positive childhood experiences that are so important. And one of the things that we know is a sense of connection and belonging in high school is really, really important. And so if your child is getting rejected, if your teenager is feeling as if they're being kicked out of a group, if they feel as if their a friendship is falling apart, that's a normal part of being an adolescent, but it's an incredibly painful part of being an adolescent. So you want to say, I get how this feels. Of course you feel this way. This is not how it's going to be forever. And Again, is there anything I can do to help? And the the key in all of this, as we're talking about this, particularly as your kids get older, is that it is really, really hard to watch your kids struggle with these big emotions and friendships falling apart and getting cut from the team and not getting a part in the school play and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to normalize that as a part of growing and learning And you have to make sure that you don't panic so much that you step in and start trying to fix it or getting in there to fight their fight for them, right? That's what, that's what oftentimes we do as parents is that it's hard for us to sit with them in their distress. So then we take action. We don't say to them, how can I help? We say, well, I'm going to go right in there and talk to that coach or I'm going to call that mother or I'm going to do this or that. You got to let them be okay in their feelings surrounded by love and support because this is how they learn that there's a way through them. What do you do if your kid, you know that this, like a rejection or some sort of school thing has happened within their social circle and you know they're in pain, but they don't, you know, there's a certain age where their feelings may not be so forthcoming. It's, it's a long ways away from when they are bleeding from a scraped knee and they're begging you for console, right? So how do you handle that? You can say something like, you know, I don't know all of what's happening right now because I haven't gotten all the details and I think you're trying to figure this out and I respect that. I just want to let you know that if there's anything you want to talk about with me or if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. So you make yourself available. One of the things that is really important to remember when you're dealing with your adolescent is that they are trying to figure things out separate from you. They're trying to develop their autonomy. They're trying to have relationships that don't involve you. All of that is normal. But what teenagers will say over and over and over again, if we get them to be honest, is that they want to know that their parents are there. They don't want their parents involved in it. They don't want their parents, you know, the analogy I give is your, your kids on the free throw line at a basketball game. They want to know you're in the stands rooting for them. They don't want you to run out onto the court and take the shot for them or to even pull up their socks and give them a drink while they're standing there. Or, t- or in front of everyone, tell them how to do it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So it's really about letting them know that you are there, that you're aware, you're there and you're aware but you're not going to step in. You're not going to overstep. And that's something that I see in family. Sometimes it happens from a very early age and that becomes the expectation, not only of the parents, but it becomes the expectation of the child that if I have a difficult thing going on, my parent will step in and fix it. So you want to recognize as they get older, they want you to be there. They want you to ask questions. They want you to acknowledge it, give them room, but don't step in. So let me just say that no parent does this perfectly. I mean, not even close. And sort of in a little paradoxical twist, when I see parents that are really, really working hard to do it perfectly, these are the parents I say, talk 85% less. You are talking too much, right? So you're not going to do it perfectly. The reason that Robin and I talked about doing this episode is because these are short phrases you can have in your back pocket and it's not 
a big, long discussion, particularly as your kids get older, they don't want to talk about all this stuff with you ad nauseum so that you feel better about it. So, ouch, we don't want to talk ad nauseum so that we as parents feel better about it. Yeah. So as if as if you were a book, I just highlighted that. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say it again. But that's so true. That is so true. Yeah. We want to feel better about it. So what you're there, you're, you're there as a presence of support and empathy and you are modeling for them. How do we take action to move forward when we're stuck and that our feelings aren't permanent and that these ups and downs in life are absolutely normal and appropriate. That's what the message that we want to give kids. Well, I like to think of these phrases as seasoning. They're salt and pepper to use in a, in a big you know, in a big meal, we're not going to salt and pepper everything. We're not going to remember them in every circumstance, but we season them because all of these phrases are ultimately supporting the tools and the foundations to help our children learn emotional management. Correct. It's emotional management and it's relational management. Well, it's also, it's moving away from empty words and empty phrases And using those that actually have impact. And that's what I like about it. If we never said good job again, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, but that'll be a hard thing. I mean, I say it all the time, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it slips out of my mouth all the time. Oh, good job, right? I just, it just comes out. Right, because how did you do that every single time? Yeah, you can't do it every single time. What I read once, you didn't say this one, I read this one somewhere else, but this is what I, I used a lot, was rather than say good job, say they just poured their first bowl of cereal by themselves. Just state what they just did. You just poured your own cereal, right? You just passed your driver's license test. You just did this. So I just repeated what they did to avoid saying good job, which is another thing to do. (laughs) Sometimes I would say, look at you. (laughs) Look at you. Yeah. They're like, I can't. I can't look at me. (laughs) Oh, this is a great way to start 2023 feeling a little more prepared. Yes. Better than trying to take care of 87 kittens. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I woke up from that dream like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. Happy New Year, everybody. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.